This is the ultimate crash course on everything you need to know about chains. So sizes, style, metal, and gauges. Hi, I'm Dana. I'm the founder of Stones and Findings, and I've created this short session so that for all of you who have not, not had much experience with chains and metals, that this would be a crash course. I have been a wholesaler of jewelry components for over 25 years, and I have been making jewelry and wholesaling that for a lot longer. So come on with me and we are going to get you started. So just um, to give you an overview of what we're going to cover in this session, we're going to talk about measurements, imperial versus metric units of measurement, diameters, lengths and averages, as well as the best thickness for permanent jewelry welding. I'm just going to assume that you don't have much experience um, with jewelry and I start with measurements because all the other things with costs, metals, that will become more evident once you've figured this out. And then we're going to talk about metals. So we're going to start with the different types of metals that are commonly used for jewelry. and then what is not suitable for permanent jewelry welding and why. Then we're gonna talk about manufacturing process, the metal content, prices, um, reactivity and allergies, and how to test for fake metals, as well as how to clean permanent jewelry. So, okay. With respect to measurements, you're going to see all sorts of ways of measuring because we now, well, there's world trade, all sorts there is, but predominantly there is imperial and metric. Imperial is the remnants of the colonial system of from the Brits. Um, and it's being used still by countries such as um, the United States, well, Britain, the British Isles. In Canada, we're a little bit mixed up. We get, we use a bit of both because we're highly influenced by the big brothers south of the border. And then the metric system, um, that is everywhere else around the world, EU, uh, most of South America, Asia, Africa. Okay, so, how does that work? In uh, Imperial, you have commonly known, you've heard yard, foot, inches. And then if you hear things like meter, centimeter, millimeter, then you know that that is metric, the hundred system, as opposed to six dozens and, and, and so on. Okay, what does that mean? Um, with some people price it online and you have to be careful. You should always see what they're pricing it as because in the States, you it is predominantly priced by the foot. And we in Canada, I, I happen to price things by the meter and in Europe, it's by the meter. So um, one meter, you get 3.28 feet, which is just under 40 uh, inches. So 39.37 inches will give you one meter. One meter um, has 100 centimeters, 1000 millimeters, and each inch has 2.5 centimeters. And then, and don't, don't have to take these notes. I'm going to put them somewhere and there are resources, charts, etc. that are free to download from my website at stonesandfindings.com. Um, you can search it up and it's free info. Okay. So what does that mean for jewelry? 
just to give you an idea, on average, if it is um, bracelets over the counter, over the counter means already there in most stores. Uh, there's no customization. The average in North America, the bracelet is usually six and a half inches, including the clasp. And then there's a one inch extension um, for necklaces right at the collarbone here is usually about six, 16 inches for me, 16 inches. And you'll find most stores for short necklaces, they're 16 inches plus two inch extension. So in extension, in case you don't know, is a loop, a chain link that is longer that your clasp can clasp onto to make your chain slightly longer. And anklets, normally, for example, in this photo, um, you can clasp onto the design it so that it's nine inches plus one inch, one inch extension, and then you can clasp onto wherever so that below the ankle bone for the average North American female is about 10 inches. Now, because um, permanent jewelry or fitted bespoke bracelets, you're not having the extension chain, which is cumbersome because it will just flop to the front oftentimes. Um, certainly, if it's too long for over-the-counter bracelets, you can clip it off, um, the, the extension, so that you have exactly what you are looking for. But the clasp swings to the front um, and you, you want it very tight um, to the clasp, but you can never clasp onto exactly because there is the trigger system where there's a link, you have to go further out and then back in to lock it. So for um, permanent jewelry, it is, you usually you don't you want very little slack and on average for female the bracelets are six and a half inches and for men seven and a half inches and there's a wide range depending on whether or not your your state or province is really into deep fried foods um some joke the diabetes capital of the u.s so it varies um then also for men, if they are athletes, um, if as, and also necklace, your, your neck, depending on the athletics, if they're swimmers, that changes, or if you're, you're very tall. Um, but on average, men 5'10", um, 185 pounds-ish, is about seven and a half inches bracelet. And for the anklet, if it is below the ankle bone, draped loosely, then it is about 10 inches. So we talked about lengths. Now we're gonna go on to thickness. Um, thicknesses for metric system is still millimeters, but for the Imperial, there's a funny thing called gauge. And even amongst um, American factories, gauge for wire and gauge for sheet is there. There's some difference and they always ask for clarification with a backup of the metric system, how many millimeters or thousands of an inch, the thickness. Um, so let's talk about wire gauges. Um, because you'll hear it also about jump rings. Basically, all chain and jump rings start with wire, long, thin, round wire gauge. And so it gives you an idea. 0.4 millimeter, you, you might, if you're European or you're importing things, buying things from Europe, you'll always get 0.4 millimeters, um, millimeters next to the gauges. And now even because American um, wholesalers and factories also ship uh, all over the world, there's usually gauge and then a millimeter measurement next to it. So 
26 is 0.4, 24 is just over half a millimeter. You don't need to, you can have charts and we have a chart on our website that you can uh, copy and put on your website or print out. And the other thing is you could also screen capture that and put it on, on your on your phone so you, you can look through. But basically it is very strange in that gauge is counterintuitive in that the bigger the number, the thinner it actually is. So if you, you're, you're finding something doesn't fit and you think, okay, 24 gauge isn't fitting, um, fitting through, I need something thinner. So I'm going to do with 22 gauge and it gets thicker. So, um, just remember and have the chart handy. Now we're going to talk about diameters because diameter has to do with thickness. And if you remember grade seven, grade six geometry, diameter is of a circle is the longest section between on the longest cross section of a circle. Um, so why is it important? Well, because you'll have jump rings. You need to know the thickness, not only the, the thickness of the ring, but how, what the diameter inside is, the outside is, uh, links of a chain and the links, the width of the chain. So you can visualize how thick it is. So you'll find most suppliers, not all, but the ones with good website would have outer diameter and the inner diameter. The outer diameter is what is on the outside. If you took a measurement from outside point to outside point, and then the inner diameter is the amount of clearance from the inside where the air is. And that is important because you always want to make sure the inner diameter clears whatever it is that there's enough room. If you're welding two links together, there's enough room um, to, to clear both the thickness of the two links together. Cause you don't want to weld something that is too tight and, and they have to overlap like that. So in everything there is uh, inner and outer diameter. Incidentally for finger rings, usually the sizing has to do with inner diameter so that when you fit it, it doesn't matter how thick the, I mean, if it's too thick, you don't want to wear it, but so that is a clearance and it's usually it states the inner diameter. Okay. So about going back to welding people, I get asked this at least once a day. What is the most popular size for jump ring size for welding? So with welding, you, unlike cold connection where you don't weld and you just close, the thickness doesn't matter for strength. As long as it is welded um, securely, properly, actually, it's fused together, it's as one, it will, you don't need a thick jump ring. If you're not welding, certainly you want something that doesn't open easily, it's not soft when you, put, when you tug at it. So thinner is actually better that you can put through. However, oftentimes when it's too thin, it's, little, it's trickier, it, it requires mastering. And I would say the most popular is 24 to 22 gauge um, for welding. And that you can weld between five and seven watts, very easily one go um, on the Sunstone welders. And I don't know about other welders out there, but I presume it would be similar if in fact um, is just as powerful. And I say what whether or not, um, it, it depends 
depends and I've got videos on that it depends on how sharp your electrode is and there might be slight variance um, and it depends on the metal S silver uh, being a little bit softer than gold or gold filled okay so and we can talk about that another time but just to answer quickly in case you're wondering 24 to 22 gauge and usually the um, outside diameter being three is good it clears most things oh there we go um, outside diameter being three inner diameter being around two millimeter clears most thin chains and if you so happen to have slightly thicker chains like this slightly chunkier links four millimeter usually clears it and if in doubt always ask your chain supplier okay popular metals for permanent jewelry you know there's so many many metals that you've heard of made into jewelry um, traditional jewelry so you got solid gold rose gold white gold platinum so those are the precious metals and then you have gold for may um, with gold plated over sterling silver um, and let's see sterling silver cop and then then the base metals stainless steel surgical steel uh, brass copper pewter so it go it goes on but just to let you know permanent jewelry is different from other forms of traditional jewelry that you could traditional jewelry you you wore it for a few hours gone out come home you take it off so even if it's not good you're you're effectively not wearing it 24 hours a day you're maybe it's two to three, maybe it's a full day, it's eight hours and you take it off. Um, whereas permanent jewelry is 24 seven, it's going in with you, showering, shampoo, by the seaside, um, swimming, you're doing dishes, all sorts of things. So that makes it very different. Um, and the other thing is, it also varies in the summertime. You know, you're sweating more, um, in the winter time, you're, you're using certain lotions uh, that you wouldn't otherwise use. Summertime, maybe sunblock that you would not use during the winter time. So it needs to stand up to a lot more. And that's why you see on um, Facebook groups that things that they know being sold at H&M or Dean's or whatnot, the, the kind of metals, they're, they're trying to use it and then all of a sudden they have customers who complain a lot because it, it is the, the way it's worn that makes a difference. And if you were to own a jewelry store or gift store that carries jewelry and you had base metal designers who work with base metal and now all of a sudden doesn't work with jewel, uh, permanent jewelry, you know, even though you've been selling it for years, that is why. Okay, so going on, well, let's talk about things that are not suitable. Plated metals. So just to let you know that um, traditionally, very inexpensive jewelry like um, things from the dollar store, uh, Art, again, Ardeen's, Aldo's, I don't know what, you know, the, the over-the-counter, inexpensive Walmart um, jewelry. While that's okay, because it's rarely worn, um, it changes. And what ch happens is the, the outer plating is very, very thin. It wears off, scratches off, chemically react, dissolves, whatnot. And then the base metal... From underneath gets exposed and what happens with copper and brass is that it there's a patina that's that is sometimes green sometimes dark brown and it changes the color of your skin either brown or green ish black um, 
in while well, your your skin you can clean it off the piece there's nothing you can do about it other than to replate it um, and most of us don't have that ability and certainly cannot work with permanent jewelry so let's talk about plating there is such a thing as flash plating which is like very fast very thin um, in many countries do this including in Italy you can ask for flash plating over something and usually it is silver plated over silver so that it's all shiny and you don't have to buff anything um, sometimes gold plated over silver but it's a flash plate it will last anywhere between three to six weeks um, and it's not expensive for for that plating it's okay if it's sterling silver underneath or maybe even um, stainless steel so that doesn't turn brown but stainless steel is kind of dark like gray color um, while that's okay it's not okay for the base metals such as copper and uh, brass then for normal plating so um, pieces of jewelry that you see in those inexpensive stores the regular plating it lasts for about one to three months of regular wear so while you think well I have jewelry that I bought for five dollars and that didn't I had it for more than three months well you didn't wear it for three months continuously you probably had it for two years and it sat in your shelf or in a in a Ziploc bag for a lot longer where, where incidentally that's where you should keep it away from sunlight airtight bag for all your jewelry so if you actually counted the number of hours days that you wore the plated jewelry that inexpensive piece that is cheap and cheerful that brings you joy um, it's probably just you didn't wear it for too long then there is plating and uh, plating that has coating also and we'll talk about coating in a minute that usually lasts for two to four months of um, regular wear now just to let you know a lot of people out there and this is a huge problem in the industry because it's confusing a lot of people name gold plated as gold filled either because they they're misunderstanding or it's intentional because gold filled is I would say about 10 times 15 times the cost of gold plated um, just a manufacturing cost and I'll explain how that's made so that is a problem with gold plated items now as I was saying gold uh, silver plated over gold oh sorry silver plated with gold uh, when it does wear off what is revealed is something that is shiny white with highlights and I document this in my on my uh, social media Instagram it's very pretty some people love that um, it it's popular because with gold filled we gonna talk about that later you cannot have casted items so casting where you have unusual motif that's thick and thin you can create all sorts of beautiful designs and then so you if you that's what you want the only way is to plate it with gold so the the inexpensive way is to have base metal and plate it with gold the more expensive and less allergic um, a way that is hypoallergenic is to have sterling silver plated with gold now there are two things here some people call it gold vermeil when it isn't gold vermeil is 
an American standard, legal standard, of having no less than two microns of gold. One micron is um, one millionth of a meter. So it's very fine, but two microns of gold is actually quite expensive. If I was to, okay, just to give you an idea. If I was to take a piece, this is at the factory level. If I was to take a piece and I played it with flash plating per gram is about 15 to 16 in gold. Flash plate is 15 to 16 euros or right now it's almost at par. So let's say 17 cents American for flash plate. Mostly it's the labor per gram. So a piece could be several grams. Um, and if it was regular plating, it's about five, uh, I mean, 50 to 60 cents, 50 to, and right now gold has gone up in price. So I would say 50 to 85 cents a gram. If I was to do gold vermeil, two microns, we're looking at about a dollar fifty per gram just for the plating. So a small piece could cost you a couple of dollars. So that gives you an idea of cost. And gold vermeil um, is very expensive because just an amount of gold. But a lot of people ask. I mean, they they list it as gold vermeil. And you need to ask, is there, are there more than two microns? If you want to know the exact answer. And if they say, uh, what is that? Then you know. <laughs> okay. Next up. Stainless steel, surgical steel, and nickel. Okay. I'm not a fan of stainless steel because I found that, I, or surgical steel, because I found myself personally allergic to, to it. Um, fewer people are allergic to surgical steel than they are nickel. And when something um, is labeled in North America, hypoallergenic, it means it has no nickel in it. That's what causes a lot of rashes. Um, and we say allergic reaction. So what happens with my ear, even with surgical steel, is it gets puffy, red, throbs, hot, and it waters. With um, a bracelet, you get these little dots like a rash. And then if you over, if you keep it up for a day or two, maybe two days, it starts to water as well. So that is what the allergic reaction um, looks like. Now, because stainless steel and surgical steel has a bit of nickel in it, people are still allergic to it. And I know that although it doesn't tarnish like brass or copper, and hence you see a lot of inexpensive, especially men's jewelry, um, because it's got a darker look to it, like a, almost a gray tone, not, not white silver, it's darker. Um, it's inexpensive, so you see a lot of um, mid-low level jewelry brands using uh, surgical steel, stainless steel for, for jewelry. And you see that also watchmakers use um, stainless steel for, for the watch bands. Surgical steel is less corrosive than stainless steel but both of them people are allergic. Um, and I know that I had that discussion at uh, PJX where I was teaching this course, uh, the Permanent Jewelry Expo in Vegas. Somebody was quite adamant because he's, he's a chain supplier and he's supplying surgical steel and he's looking for cheaper and better suppliers. We had a discussion there and then and later and he was quite respectful you know you can i'm not here to argue it is what it is 
and there are suppliers out there who do gold filled and they say well this is better because they say gold filled but it's stainless steel underneath and it's actually better no it a lot of them and I'll discuss what gold filled is later I'm not here to try to change anyone's minds um, and people hunker down and debate or fight with me vehemently because they've invested all this money in to me inferior chain and they want to believe that it is as good or better because whatever it is what it is okay so I would not recommend it okay let's talk about gold solid gold everyone loves gold but it's, it's very expensive and actually I during vacation I went to Colombia Cartagena and I found a museum with Inca jewelry beautiful pieces earring threaders all sorts of uh, hair ornament things all in gold and I guess that's where the gold rush uh, people from Europe all came over to to North America and South America to try to find gold because it doesn't tarnish it's beautiful it looks rich and shiny and with pure gold that's 24 carats okay that I don't know why they came up with that actually but what is also popular is 22 18 14 and 10 karat gold for jewelry and what that means people like what is 14 and how much gold is there so 24 means a hundred percent 14 karat gold is 14 over 24 um, which is equal to 58 percent gold of the mass of the weight and everything else is an alloy people ask what what's in the alloy so um, pure gold is very soft it's not doesn't things don't stay in shape even if you were to uh, temper it like tumbling and hardening the metal um, it's still very soft so they, they mix it there could be concentration of brass copper some silver um, usually brass just to make it slightly harder okay so you hear about rose gold what is it in the all it is is in the alloy where it gets that pinky color is there's more um, copper than there is brass and white gold has a higher concentration of silver zinc or palladium and so talking about that white gold actually does tarnish I have a band because I love silver um, my wedding band is made of um, white gold and then when it started tarnishing while I was wearing it like that, I was really bummed. I thought he ripped me off and I was going to, I don't know, do something nasty to the guy. But then I found, and I thought, you know what, it shouldn't happen. And I did the search. So don't go kicking down the office door to your jeweler yet. Okay, let's talk about sterling silver, one of my favorite things. Um, in fact, solid gold or gold there are no industrial uses for gold it's purely ornamental purely um, and and it's very expensive there's limited amount in the world just so you know and whereas sterling silver there's a lot of industrial uses it's extremely popular uh, for jewelry for a number of reasons and I'll go over that so with fine what you call fine silver is pure silver it's 99% silver then it's fine silver 
It's not popular for jewelry because it is also very soft and it tarnishes very easily. But there are some cases where you do need um, fine silver and you'll find, for example, fusing in glass, people use fine silver. What is sterling silver? You'll see a lot of jewelry is stamped 925. So I, I guess it must have been a guy or a girl, man, woman uh, named Sterling who came up with a formula. Sterling silver is equivalent to 92.5% silver with 7.5% alloy. And in it is usually copper. Um, incidentally, depending on which uh, country your, your silver is from, your sterling is from, they have different mixes um, and even different smelting companies, different manufacturers. Because I noticed that in Israel, their silver, they would have a more expensive additive, um, could be palladium and to make it shiny and won't tarnish as quickly. Um, okay, so people always ask, will silver tarnish? And the answer is yes, it will tarnish. That is the beauty of it and I'll explain why. Traditionally, silver for eons would be used in um, things for testing, tools for testing for poison for the kings. So a needle would be, because it'll, it'll touch things like, um, because it'll react with some certain chemicals like arsenic, sulfur, it'll turn dark. So for food, they would do that. Silver goblets in, in um, I guess in, at the court, it'll, tar it'll tarnish if you know people it's all polished up it will tarnish when it touches poison so it's many uses and i personally find it really beautiful because when it does like picture frames cutlery um all sorts of motifs think brushes and old especially Victorians do this very well. Anyway, the motifs darken. And then if you buff the top, it gives, it highlights the design. So I, I find it really beautiful as do many people. Oh, by the way, some of the industrial uses of silver. Um, do you know that x-rays use silver? Uh, for the x-ray for a dent at the dentist lots of machinery uses sterling silver so that's why um, prices have come up dramatically silver over over the last five ten years <sighs> but I love it and most people are not allergic to it but there are still people who are now anti-tarnish coating there is so going back to uh, tarnishing, people want to know, oh, will it tarnish? Because I don't want to, I don't want to, if it's, if it tarnishes. Well, there are different kinds of coating, protective coatings out there. There is e-coating, um, which, or, or jewelry coating, which is like, a, almost like ceramic, a dip that's milky substance, you hang it, excess dries off, put it in the high temperature oven, fires, there's a there's a coating. The problem with that is that you cannot weld the surface. You can weld around it. Um, you can't solder, and once it's coated, it's really hard to get out. There's no reverse, not that I know of any liquid, whereas there is such a thing as jewelry lacquer, which you can buy at goldsmith stores online. Um, if you can't find any, just just email me and I think um, a number of American store everywhere would sell it and I'll give you the name. 
it is kind of like diluted clear nail polish. And what they do is they, they dip it. Um, with chain though, it's a little bit tricky because it gets stiff. If you can imagine applying lacquer, jewelry, um, nail polish or varnish, clear coat varnish on it, it gets stiff. So how they do it is um, they, for chains, especially if, it, if it's uh, been antiqued, polished, I've seen this happen. They dip in that and they whip it like this. And it just, but well, okay, don't whip it like this. You, you whip it on the side and it flings all over the walls, the excess is there. With charms and whatnot, they usually have, have it dipped, um, put into a box of dried, dried bits, like wood chips, but they're specifically for jewelry making. And they shake, shake, shake. That takes off the top layers without the piece, without the, the chip sticking to the, uh, the piece. So you do that and then um, take out the, the pieces or you can wire and then dip and, and fling it. It's on a rack and you hang it. So um, I've done that with my castings before. It is a lot more labor intensive and I find um, actually like it tarnishing a bit. Then there is such a thing. Um, the Italians have come up with something called a jere and which is patented by a firm. There are also um, different factories also come up with their similar formulas and that's only been a year, less than a year. It doesn't cost a lot. It is labor intensive and it is a chemical coating. So it's not like a lacquer coating where, it, where it's like adding a coating, but it's a chemical thing. Um, you dip it and, it, and, and let it dry off. And what it does is apparently under UV light, say if you're in a store at, by the window, it will not tarnish for, was it a year or two years? I cannot remember, two years. If, so under glass, if it is a, a piece that is um, you're trying on, so people are touching it, it's supposed to not tarnish for about a year. At Stones and Findings, we have all our chains, new chains, um, with exception of very old pieces, we have it in that coating and it makes a big difference because we have fluorescent lights and we used to cover our silver. Um, if we're leaving on a Friday and we don't work on the weekend, we come back, we lift it. Now, year round, I just leave it and it, it really does make a difference. And also, I personally make jewelry that I sell to galleries and when it's out on display in their rack, it turns very quickly, but it has not done so um, with the coating. Okay, allergies to sterling silver. There are people who are allergic to solid gold, even. So if, and it's hard to know it whether or not um, someone is, it could be the brass in the sterling that they're allergic to. Um, but certainly fewer people are allergic to sterling silver than there are allergic to brass, copper, surgical steel, uh, zinc, tin, pewter. So again, when jewelry is labeled hypoallergenic, it means it has no nickel in it. And sterling silver in, I think, Europe and in the US, they're not supposed to have nickel in it. Okay, so we're gonna talk about gold filled because everyone, there's so much confusion. Um, it's a misnomer, I feel. 
Gold filled, it has a very strange name because it's not filled with gold. Quite the reverse, actually. And people make fun of it. The reason is, actually, it was developed in the 1930s as a way of making gold jewelry that lasts a lifetime, just as solid gold, but making it more affordable. And um, that was, you know, during the Depression. So how they did that was they started with a tube of solid gold and they filled it with brass. So it was gold filled with brass. And then just, they eventually just called it gold filled. So here you see in the photo, there's solid gold, gold filled has far more, a hundred times more gold than any plating process out there. That gives you an idea as comparison. Now, gold filled wire, just to let you know, basically um, it is a base, it is a component, is a basic component for all chains and jump ring and how it is is there is an overlay of gold over brass and it takes very sensitive very very sensitive equipment to be able to do this to bond it permanently there's only one company in the world that makes gold filled wire and gold filled sheets because you, you you have to you can't just bang it out in your garage or a cheap um, manufacturing process and you'll see that there are gold filled some gold filled chains and pendants coming out of Asia well they buy if it's actually really real gold filled they've purchased um, the gold filled from an American source, from the American source. And all chain manufacturers in this US that provides gold filled bought it from this chain source, from the gold filled source. And um, it's heavily regulated. Let me see, did I? Yeah, okay. It's heavily regulated. They're, they also make sheets. Now, with sheets, there is single clad, so it's only one side, and you would do that if you, when would you use it? You'd use it if you're doing, say, like a hollow form, domed, so you don't need gold, because it's gonna be sealed off, um, like a pendant like this. Um, Two-sided is the most popular, double-sided, double clad, gold filled. The stamping, denotation, the quality stamp, usually, okay, so the most popular is 14 karat gold filled. And it's usually denoted by 14 slash 20 gold filled, GF, or one over 20, 14K. So 14K is a 14 karat gold. One, one, over 20 is the amount of um, the gold and gold filled that so those two are used interchangeably and I'll explain what that actually means what you need to be gold filled so for something to be gold filled two things must happen yes very importantly and it bugs me when um, when people cut corners and they just name it because they can they can double, triple their money. Because it's not the same at all. Two different beasts from plated. So gold content must be at least 5% gold of the carrot. So um, in other words, example, if it is 14 karat gold filled, it must have 5% of its weight in 14 karat gold. So if you actually do the math, 
1 over 20, that's 5%, times, this is 14 karat gold, so that's 14 over 24 being solid, it's 0 0.29. So if you took gold filled and you melted it, it should have 2.9% solid gold of its weight. How can you tell you can't, you, you'd have to melt down the piece and there is no home test um, that's reliable. You have to pay for an assay test to a lab. They'll destroy the sample. You need at least five grams for the test and the test generally costs about $150 in North America. The um, Federal Trade Commission in the U.S. allows for 10% tolerance because it's very sensitive machinery and sometimes it's thinner and, you know, it, we're, we're, we're really, it's a fine instrument that they require. They allow 10%. So that means if you melted your gold filled 14 karat, As long as it has 2.61, that's 10% off, it's acceptable if it came to dispute a court. The second thing that is really important, because it'd be really cheap to have gold wire that is only 2.9% gold and you mix everything else, that, that'd be, that's like, instead of 14 carat, it's less than a carat or whatnot. It's very easy to make, but gold filled is expensive. It lasts a long time for, it acts like permanent, um, sorry, it acts like solid gold because it's a lifetime product. And that happens only because it is, all that gold is on the outside. So your wear and tear, it's the same. It works just like your solid gold because all of the gold is on the outside. And how you test that is through an acid scratch test. Um, JSP makes that and you can get that at any jewelry supply store online. And basically what it, it is, is bottles of acid to test 24, 18, 22, 24, um, sorry, 14, and I think there's one that's for 10 carat. So these are acids. And that black stone is a scratch stone. It's a stone that is abrasive. I think it's like slate. It's abrasive. And you take your piece of jewelry or chain and you rub on it. You'll see that there's gold on on the stone then you take the liquid that if you're testing for 14 karat you take 14 and you do a couple of drops like that on it and you leave it for a few 15 seconds um and i'll tell you a story in a minute if the gold in the drop disappears because it's been eaten Basically, this, th this acid eats everything but the gold. So if the gold disappears, there's not enough in it. So you can test out if it's plated. Um, this is, it's a very useful tool, but it cannot, it, it can only test the surface. So you can't. If the surface is thick, but but it's this this big and it's all, you, you, then it's not 14 karat gold either, gold filled. So anyway, my story about scratch tests, you have to be really careful. That is very corrosive and I had no idea. I had dropped it and I'm trying to test and I, I did it with one that I knew was gold, then I did plated with so those are my samples and I, I did that and 
some of the samples didn't disappear because well, it's gold, it's, it's real. But I thought, I'm just gonna wait a little bit. Now, I didn't smell anything at first, and then I wasn't feeling too well. I waited 15 minutes. Anyway, make a long story short, I started feeling not so great, like nauseous in my throat. Started to hurt. And I thought, oh, <laughs> maybe it's this thing. Because I was just filming, I was by myself. And I turned on the vent and I, I thought, oh, I better rinse this off. Anyway, that could be dangerous. I could have fainted. I could have, I don't know what happened. It was just a few drops. Um, that evening, my throat felt like I had strep throat for about three, four hours. I can't remember. I was a little bit worried. I was fine the next day. But um, so be careful. Go do it outside, heavily vent ventilated area, wear goggles, gloves. I didn't do any of those things, but I thought I'll just be careful. Anyway, but I live to tell. Okay, durability of gold filled and why we are willing to pay so much more for it. It is a lifetime product. There's a hundred times more gold in gold filled than there is in gold plated. I know on Etsy, Alibaba, there are a whole bunch of suppliers out there saying gold filled and you don't know. Well, how, how do you know other than to perform your, the expensive tests on everything? One, I think, Go by referrals, join Facebook groups or whatnot, okay? Um, to see if that manufacturer has come up with things that are no good before. So get references. But if you're working with a new supplier and you're not sure and you don't have the luxury, but you really wanna buy that, because I've been there, I'll tell you more about that. Well, Ask very pointed questions. Because, for example, let's say Alibaba. Price is right. So, oh, same thing with Etsy. So I did, I, we always try to find something new, wonderful, and it's worth, I thought it was worth a try. So I asked, is it gold filled? Yes. Oh. But no, is it really gold filled or are you talking about plating, plated gold? No, good gold filled. And I'm, I am I see in the back there's plating material. Okay, so gold filled in North America, they also plate it. So they do a finish because all of the links are welded to be soldered or welded. And there might be a seam and they finish it in different finishes. So there is Hamilton, which is very popular. I like one that looks more, less orangey. Um, so I have a special plating for all of my chains and it's actually just called special chain. So that it looks like the solid gold. Anyway, I see equipment and I ask, oh, is that, so they're, they swore up and down, up and down. It is gold filled. Don't worry, our quality is excellent. We have many, many customers. Don't worry, don't worry. So finally, I, I was thinking, oh, but I, so I decided to ask in a different way. Oh, is it is it plating? Oh, is it a very heavy, heavy plating? I just need to know, um, is it a durable plating? And then they say, yes. Okay. This was, I don't know where we're going back and forth. Finally, yeah, it's a heavy plating. It's a special plating. It's triple plated, whatever. It is not gold filled. The fact that they said it was gold filled, even though it wasn't, and I asked, is it plated? I didn't, needless to say, I didn't buy anything from that person, from that factory. And it was a big factory too. Um, and then I also bought something on Etsy 
because a number of people have said, oh, they have really good connectors. Um, and these, this factory was willing to customize whatever it is that I, I wanted. And I, that's what I wanted. I wanted someone to customize and I have, we've got lots of designs and I want really good quality. And I told him, uh, we check. So actually we do samples. Um, and we do assay test and the acid test. And I had told him, you need to know whatever it is that you're going to send me that I perform these two tests. Okay. I got it, done it. It was under, how could it be? He swore up and down anyway. So it got more. Well, we, we sent more because maybe there was a, and the other thing is when you are sending a sample, you should always, there are a few things to, to do with samples. One, when you're doing assay test, it has to be uh, a blind test, meaning no company info. I just do sample A, B, C, like that. The other thing is I always do samples with my existing customers, I mean, existing suppliers that I know for sure. And I do, and I random, I do random uh, tests anyway. I put it together. I only, I know which sample is which, and I have photos and you, you, you keep it all separate and the lab should take photos so that there's no, to minimize any errors. And what I did was I, I sent it. And the, the reason why you want also the control samples, maybe it was an off day with the equipment, but this Etsy supplier came back and his was the only one amongst all of my other ones that I had sent in that day, a number of them was the only one that was under. The second time, okay, I did it, put more just in case if there was an issue, even though I always have more then just more is more accurate, but it costs more, right? So the second time I did that, same thing. It, it was, and the second time I used other, um, some other blind sources just so, so as to mix it up and the lab wouldn't make a mistake. So ask pointed questions, um, you, you do have to test. So we test all of ours so that our customers don't have to test it. And needless to say, um, I stand behind our product and we, we shipped it back. And I did tell the, the person, the factory, um, either you give me my money back or I have to, I have to name you um, reveal it. So anyway, I'm going to give him the benefit of the doubt. He's going to work out work to figure out what the, where the problem was, but I just didn't want our customers to have anything to do with that. Okay. I get asked this a lot and it's a very good question. Can you actually weld gold filled? And I have, um, a video on YouTube that, um, where I discuss this and yes, you can. What happens is when you fuse it, the jump ring that is made of gold filled, some of the brass, the, the, the metal is melted for the fusing. It comes up. So over time there is going to be, and it could be a matter of days, there's going to be a dot. You see in the photo, in most of my photos, if there is a dot right at the jump ring at the tip, um, it's about the size, depending on how much power if you really melted it. But usually um, there is half a poppy seed size, just half a poppy seed. Doesn't bother people, but if it bothers you, you can use solid gold jump rings. The difference between uh, gold filled jump ring. The gold filled jump ring is about 
12 cents, depending on size, nine to 12 cents. Yes, and some, some bigger ones are slightly more. And for solid gold, it's about a dollar something. So whether or not it bothers you. And the other thing you can do is you should weld it on yourself and show it to people um, what it looks like and price it so that um, your your bracelets are gold filled and if they want solid gold, you can add it on or something. But so that bracelet on in the photo is that of my 11 year old daughter um, and she's not delicate. That is after three months of wear, um, of camp, swimming, everything. And over time, the exposed brass darkens. So that's, that's what it looks like. Allergies to gold felt. Okay, if you, first off, if you have allergic reaction to solid gold, for sure you're gonna have allergic reaction to gold felt. Um, because outside is the same. The other thing is, some people, it, it's not common, but it's also not really rare, have brass allergies. And somehow their skin, and it could be low iron, I have heard that, low iron draws it out. Um, they, it's chemical reaction, the pH in the skin, and the people who have gold filled, it, um, it mine, I don't have that problem. And gold filled from a year ago looks the same as new on a roll, except maybe I scratched it a little bit, but in, in that it just, but it looks new pretty much. Whereas someone with a brass allergy could be a couple of days, could be a few hours, depends on the crazy skin situation. They darken. Um, the other thing is, Quite often, you'll find online um, pendants that are cut out and you, people ask. So the edges around it, is that also plated? So, or is it exposed brass? Most of the time it's exposed brass. And I don't dislike it because if I had a message or a word, let me see if you can see it here. Um, like in my case, an initial, it being inside slightly darker actually accentuates it. Um, on the outside, it's slightly darker. I don't, doesn't bother me. So it depends on your comfort level, but in the market, most of the time it's out there. The other thing is I forgot if you are just mental note and it so happens also for silver if you want it to be not noticeable your weld least noticeable if it is circular like a jump ring and you weld it here there's going to be a dot if you were to just press around it press the other side like the other side so it's perpendicular what happens is, okay, it'll, it, if you press it this way, naturally, if it's now an oval, and this was the weld, naturally when you're pulling it, it goes this way, along with the other links, and it gets hidden like this, just because you pull it and it's in the, you're wearing it, draping it, it naturally goes like this, your links, and where you're, where your seam was, I'm not doing it. Okay, let's do this. So it's welded like this, you press on it, it goes like this, the links, it gets hidden. So if it bothers you, just put do that, press down a little bit so that it goes hidden in the other links. So that's a trick. Um, and back to the brass allergies, I would say maybe five to 10% of the population, 5% of the population has it. We sell lots and lots and lots of chains and my, our 
manager is a rarity. She has brass allergy and I've seen it maybe six or seven times um, online, people are recording that. So there you have it. I also discovered there is such a thing made in Italy called gold clad. Gold clad. So I'm like gold filled, but they call it gold clad. And basically it is thick gold, 5%. No, in this case, I've not found 5%. It was 10%. And another place had at 20% sheet gold on top of sterling silver. Now I'm still looking into it a bit more because it's quite a bit more expensive than gold filled because it's no longer 5% gold, it's 10. Um, I'm hoping to see if we could do, find out if it's 5% on top of sterling silver so that you can alleviate brass allergies. But again, brass allergies are rare and you should just let people know that if so happens that there's brass allergy, then you might want to in, it, in gold filled darkens because of chemical reaction, you might want to go with sterling silver or solid gold. As long as you let people know in advance, it's good. Okay, chains stretching. I get this a lot. All delicate chains stretch, gotta tell you. Doesn't even matter what metal. And, you know, if, <laughs> for it to not stretch it would be and it would have to be pretty thick I get especially anklets because muscles moving all the time and um, if it doesn't stretch as an anklet then it's like a shackle it needs to be that thick um, okay in general rules of thumb okay if it is a wire that has been flattened worked on, hammered, it's going to be stronger than one that's round and not worked on. In general, thin wires stretch more than thick wires, duh, right? But if the thin wire is twisted and worked on so that it becomes a thicker thing, just like, you know, rope, well, rope is just lots of fibers twisted together, then twisted together, then twisted together. It's very strong in that way. Um, if people say, oh, well, I don't want it to stretch. Well, if, and then there are people who say, well, shouldn't you keep a break in your, in your bracelet so that if it pulls, if you get it caught on a handle, if it pulls, it can break. Yes, you can do that. If it breaks, it breaks. And if it stretches, you just, if you get caught, just re-weld it, cut it, weld it. Now, certain chains, once they stretch, they lose the, the look and I, I've had that problem. I had a very fine cable chain um, that was not hammered and I, I like to do this all the time. I, I had it and I began fidgeting and pulling on it, pulling on it, pulling on it as I'm listening to people. And I realized, hey, it's, it's longer than my other bracelets. So the best thing to do is to ask the chain supplier, your manufacturer, is this going to stretch? Is it not a good thing for a, an anklet? Is it not good for, um, permanent bracelet. So I think it's better to, for you to just ask, they'll tell it's, they'll tell you the truth. Well, it works in their best interest to tell you the truth. And I should hope you have a good supplier who will tell you the truth. Um, so with anklets, I have a video where I was testing it. The thing is when your the leg, some people are welding it right above the, above the ankle bone, but the narrowest part of their leg after the calf. The problem is when, as you're walking, you're flexing and the Achilles muscle, the tendon back at the 
the back of the leg, it stretches, it stretches, and you can feel it. And gravity takes the chain down, and then it's stretching. It's going down and stretching, so it will stretch. Um, explain that to the customer, and you can just do a reweld or go with something slightly thicker but flat so that it's not too uncomfortable. Okay, I hope you have enjoyed that and it's been informative. Please feel free to let me know if there were things that you wish I would have covered. Perhaps you can comment below in the comments and I can answer in case other people are reading it or perhaps if it is something bigger, I can do another video on specifically that topic. And as always, I really, really appreciate um, you guys supporting me. And the best way to do that is so, to subscribe. Let me know what you think so that I'm not <laughs> filming in the vacuum. Interact with me and um, I really appreciate it. I'm gonna leave a link below to Stones and Findings, a wholesaler of premium quality chains and findings as well as the Orion Micro Welder that I've used in welding a lot of my bracelets and um, while doing videos. Thank you.